Hello, and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Comrades, a podcast discussing current events, theory, and action through a radical lens. Oh boy, this has been a week. Since our last regularly programmed episode, we have seen sustained uprisings rock the so-called United States. All across this country, people are rising up in revolt to demand justice for the victims of state violence and to call for the abolition of the police. We find ourselves at a crucial juncture in history, and it's at once deeply thrilling and profoundly traumatic to recognize oneself as an agent, however small, in the struggle for universal liberation. Thrilling because it means that maybe, just maybe, we might live to see the promised land. Dramatic because so many have already suffered, and God only knows how many more will suffer, to bring abolition into fruition. I hope that wherever you are in this sick, beautiful world, you are finding time to pursue whatever it is that brings you pleasure. I wish you joy, joy, joy. Make no mistake, comrades, we're in this for the long haul. We must love and protect one another because no one else will. We keep us safe. Stay wild out there, comrades. Before we get to today's episode, I want to share a PSA with you generated by the Channel Zero Network. With protests continuing in cities all over the world, the Channel Zero Network has some reminders on how to support those who have been arrested and those who may be arrested in the coming days and weeks. Arrests are one tool cops use to repress mass movements. Arrests keep protesters off the streets during demonstrations. They scare people with the threat of court cases and potential prison sentences. Alone, we feel defenseless against the police and the courts. By providing jail and court support, we can push back against this repression from the moment our comrades are taken in to the end of their court case. Before heading out into the streets, make sure you and everyone you're with has a contact number written on their body. You'll need to get in touch with someone if you're arrested, and you most likely won't have your personal belongings with you. This number can be the National Lawyers Guild, a group you're currently involved with, or just their friend who's not at the protest. If you see someone getting arrested, call your legal support number with the arrestee's legal name and birthday. If you are in a large city, you may have to determine where they will be taken. Try to find the arresting officer's precinct or unit. This may determine where your comrade ends up. In smaller cities, everyone may go to the same place. If you expect more arrests, try to stay and observe. If not, you should head to the precinct and wait for the arrestee. Once at the precinct, use the legal name and birthday of the arrestee to ask the cops for the arrest number, charges, and where the arrestee will be taken or held. Keep anyone supporting you in a loop. Be prepared to wait many hours. Keep in touch with others and take turns waiting outside the precinct. In some cases, it may take the whole night, especially if there's been a mass arrest. From here, each city and state has different processes and different jargon. Connect with local organizers and read about local laws to learn what the process will be in your area. Here are some things you might encounter. Sometimes arrestees are released quickly with a notice that they'll need to show up in court at a later date. If this happens, take the contact info of the arrestee. You'll want to be ready to offer them court support in the future. Sometimes, arrestees are charged before release. This is a longer process, usually called arraignment, which is a procedural court hearing to file charges and set bail. The court will assign a public defender for arraignments. Try to have a couple of friends attend the arraignment for support. Due to COVID-19, you may only be able to observe via video. Sometimes arrestees will have to post bail to be released. If bail is set, let the court officer know you're arranging payment and will be coordinating with the arrestee's lawyer. If you need support making bail, connect with local organizers. There may be a bail fund for protesters in your area. No matter what happens, always relay what's happening to other people offering support. Regardless of the legal situation the arrestee ends up in, you'll need to bring some things with you. People who are getting out may be exhausted or have trouble getting home. So bring snacks, water, aspirin, bus fare, transit cards, and cigarettes. If you have a friend being held, you can bring their favorite snacks. 
If you know the Oresti requires specific medication, make sure to bring that too. You'll also need water and snacks to sustain yourself. Bring external batteries for charging phones as you may be waiting many hours. If you can't stay and help with jail support, dropping off materials to those waiting can be a big help. Unfortunately, there is a high risk of exposure to COVID-19 while in an enclosed jail cell. Oresti should consider self-quarantining and getting tested. For every street action and every viral video of arrests, there are dozens of people outside the spotlight supporting the movement. It's not over till everyone's safely gotten out of prison and everyone's beaten their charges. Check out Rebel Steps Jail Support episode at rebelsteps.com forward slash jail support for more tips and resources. And follow Unicorn Riot and Channel Zero Network member It's Going Down for more updates. The Channel Zero Network sends y'all solidarity. Stay safe out there and never stop fighting for a better world. As of this recording, the CZN has created two different PSAs for the ongoing uprising. The first, which you just heard, is about doing jail support. The second is about keeping yourself safe at street actions. We've included links to both in the show notes. If you host a podcast or a radio show, we strongly encourage you to use the PSAs in your program as well. Information is free. Intellectual property is bullshit. Keep your eyes peeled for future PSAs from the Channel Zero Network. Hi, I'm Eamon from the Radical People podcast on Channel Zero Network. Did you know that the Earth First Journal is turning 40 years old this year? If you're not familiar, the Earth First Journal is a radical print magazine committed to reporting on resistance and defense of the wild. For four decades, they have covered everything from forest defense and sabotage to street demonstrations and lockdowns. If you are interested in reading and supporting the journal, as well as getting some history of Earth First, buy a one-year subscription now and get the 40th anniversary issue upon release this summer. And if you'd like to receive a 20% discount on a year-long subscription, upon checkout, enter the promo code EFJ40THCZN. Coffee with Comrades is a proud part of the CZN and the Rev Left Radio Federation. This month, we're aiming the focus on Doomer vs. Bloomer, our CZN Spotlight of the Month. Doomer vs. Bloomer is a podcast with my friends Franz and Kami. Every episode features the two of them facing off and debating about a subject from a hopeful and a nihilistic perspective. The conversations are sobering, powerful, and oftentimes hilarious. We had them on our show back for episode 83, Don't Just Mourn, Organize. Check out this jingle for Doomer vs. Bloomer. I'm Kami. And I'm Franz. And together we are co-hosts of the Doomer vs. Bloomer podcast on the Channel Zero Network. Every week I'm going to complain about how the world is fucked. Things are definitely going to get worse before they get better, and we're all probably going to die. And I disagree with Kami and think that having hope is important. We can make things better, but only if we believe we can and put in all the effort we're able to into organizing against capitalism in the state. Yeah, we'll see. (laughs) That's the core of our podcast, y'all. It's our shtick. We disagree. (laughs) Uh, find our show on SoundCloud or whenever, wherever you find podcasts and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Doomer v. Bloomer. Also, with all this tumult going on in the U.S. right now, I've decided to push back our second Q&A episode. Initially, I had wanted to use the Q&A to commemorate the two-year anniversary of this program, which is next week, but with everything happening right now, that just seemed in sort of poor taste. Rest assured, if you've already sent in questions, we will 100% still use them, but we'll just push back the Q&A to our 100th episode instead. Thanks in advance for understanding. And keep sending us questions to use on the show. You can record them on a voice recorder app on your phone, or you can send them to us via coffeewithcomrades at gmail.com. You can also hit us up via DM on Twitter or Instagram. If you don't like the way your voice sounds when it's recorded, that's totally cool. I get it. I don't like the way my voice sounds when it's recorded uh, in particular. But regardless, you can always send us the text as well, and we will read it out on the show. All right, with that out of the way, please enjoy episode 89 of Coffee with Comrades, Comfort and Uncertainty, featuring Bitchy Shit Show.
So how was your book club? Oh my gosh, it was amazing. It was so, so good. So we're reading Braiding Sweetgrass together. Uh, we have about 12 to 14 people who are regulars in the book club that we host on our Discord server. Sick. And we just have the richest, most incredible conversations. And uh, we have people from all different walks of life. So you just get to have these wonderful perspectives um, but grounded by, you know, this, we're, we're all reading the same material and processing it together. And it's just, it's just wonderful. That rules. Yeah. Yes. It is, uh, Nicole's secret weapon, her book clubs, <laughs> it is, <laughs> which we will, uh, get into a little bit later, I think more, but yeah, her book clubs are super fun. I unfortunately have not made any of them yet cause I'm a slacker. Who does not? Uh-oh. Shame. Yeah. Get up at, <laughs> at that time in the morning. So <laughs> one of these days, though. <laughs> that's that's totally fair. What made you all settle on uh, Braiding Sweetgrass? So uh, this is the third book that we've read so far. And um, we're very good friends with Mexi and Maureen from the Vegan Vanguard. And, of course, you know, Mexi is always... Uh, talking about braiding sweetgrass and I that's actually how I discovered this show was I listened to your interview with with Mexi and she had read some passages uh, from it on the show and I just was like okay I need to read this book so we're very democratic we always vote on what what book we're gonna read um, and this one won pretty handily and so we're just all it's so beautifully written oh that, I know the prose yeah, is so it, just like, ah, uh, it's so rich and like rhapsodic. It's lovely. It's so lovely. So we we just met for two hours and it wasn't enough. And we're you know we just read one section of it and and still there was there's so much there that you can just talk for hours and hours about the concepts in the book. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Well, uh, I'm excited to kind of uh, dig into this conversation with y'all today. On today's edition of Coffee with Comrades, I am very pleased to be joined by Callie and Nicole of Bitchy Shit Show. What is good, y'all? <laughs> hey! <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is good is um, all of these protests going down. I have not in a long time felt this much joy and hope about where we're at. <sighs> Oh my Same. god, yes. I've been feeling kind of bad because part of me is seeing a lot of people, you know, posting about like, oh my gosh, this is so scary and these are crazy times. And I'm like, honestly, I feel better over these last few days than I have felt in years. Like yeah, actually seeing people resist. And I mean, I think the hardest part about being someone who's like not kind of following the corporate uh, party line, right? Our government party line is feeling like you're in this constant state of being gaslit, right? Like you're looking around and you're like, I live in such a, a violent society that likes to pretend that it's proper and, uh, polite and it's not any of those things, you know? Um, so seeing people actually resist makes me feel like oh, I can take a breath and I'm really hopeful that this is going to spark into something bigger you know the actual revolution that we we truly need in this country so i have been living for it honestly <laughs> yeah it's been interesting our our international friends have been reaching out the last couple days being like are you okay <laughs> just like really concerned and i'm like i'm fucking great yeah. <laughs> like i am just so much better than i was you know even a few days ago um yeah. so yeah i do think you know, obviously there's a lot of concern and a lot of um, fear and difficult emotions around what our president's doing and going online and seeing the people who have bought into this idea that, like, if you loot or riot, you're a thug and it's, you know, your own fault. That's always really difficult to see. But just seeing the pulse of humanity come out and just say enough and the escalation of all of it is is beautiful yeah. and just so inspiring. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, Tallahassee over the last couple of days has set it to fuck off, and it's been really <laughs> encouraging to see because I honestly never expected that shit would go down just quite so 
exuberantly as it has here. Um, you know, this may be the capital city, but it's predominantly like a college town. Um, and it's been, you know, incredibly inspiring to see the way that young people, you know, specifically like young black and brown folks have come out and really like taken up the torch and led the charge. And, you know, it's been super spontaneous and organic and um, surprisingly militant. Um, like any, you know, protest these days, you're going to still have your fair share of peace police who are like, don't do this or don't do that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's been it's been really encouraging. And, and you know, Tallahassee is, is one of the most segregated cities in the South. Um, mm. And that is on clear display um here in the last couple of days and um you know i don't think that one protest or one demonstration uh, is going to be able to um heal that uh, or or um create a more equitable and a more egalitarian and a more liberated um, alternative, but I think it is one step towards it, and that that is encouraging in and of itself, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, exactly. Well, and the fact that this spread so quickly to so many cities, I mean, the latest count has it like well over thirty, um, and it's probably even more than that. The thing, yeah, that's... I, it's going down. Said it was over fifty, and they have they've had this like running list. So <laughs> yeah, it's it's fucking going off. Shit. Yeah, and like and internationally too, all of these other cities around the world are even doing like having Black Lives Matter protests. Mm -hmm. Like that is incredible, you know. And and obviously my heart is really hurting for all the people that are being <laughs> getting violated by police um and just but people are seeing it finally. Like, the police don't give a fuck right now. Like, they are... They're hurting journalists. I was reading some story last night about a journalist who is now permanently blind in one eye because the cop shot her in the face with a rubber bullet. And he aimed at her face. Yeah. They do <laughs> it know? intentionally. Uh, they do it intentionally do. All, across the, all across the planet, from Chile to France to Hong Kong. I mean, they aim at yeah. people's faces and they aim at people's knees um jasper uh, Poir wrote this really excellent book uh called the right to maim which is about how um political authorities use their ability to cause us physical harm not to kill us but to cause us physical harm as a deterrent uh for people rising up and, and expressing their dissent and really great book highly recommend it um it is uh, difficult to read um, because of the harrowing nature of it, but uh, Jasper Poir does an excellent job of tracing the right to maim from everything from Black Lives Matter to Ferguson to uh, Palestine to everywhere mm -hmm. in between. And so, you know, what we're seeing is not uh, anything new. Um, if, if this is your first time kind of like logging on, so to speak, you know, this shit's been going down uh, ever since the state has been a thing. Um, and, you know, the ability to um, project it and make it more available to people is what I think is new. And I think that more and more people, um, since the advent and the uprising of Black Lives Matter, which started with Trayvon Martin and then built with Ferguson and is now, I think, really getting... Um, <laughs> for lack of a better term, set the fuck off because of George Floyd. I think it's it's only... A matter of time before um something shifts like there's definitely there it, there's something feels different this time and, and it's encouraging it does feel different it really mm -hmm. does and so yeah it gives me a lot of hope and you know i've been trying to educate myself more on everything really um <laughs> And, and just reading everything and understanding the U.S. government's role as, like, global police, it we really have to fundamentally change something here to fundamentally change things. Because mm -hmm. we have such a heavy hand in keeping other countries from having successful revolutions of their own. Um, I mean, they have them, but then we come in and intercede that we really, if we can do something real here... It just has these massive global implications. And I think seeing that participation, 
you know, having the podcast uh, as long as we have, or having a podcast as long as we have, something that has come through very clearly to us is how much other people are involved in U.S. politics around the world because of how heavily it impacts their daily lives. So yeah, just seeing this, I didn't think we had it in us. So just seeing this, this pop off and this, uh, people just pouring into the streets and, and the transparency of what's happening. The fact that, you know, cell phones are so widely available. People are video recording everything. And I just, it feels really, really hopeful to me that this could be the start of something, something real. Yeah. Yeah. And it, coming at this time, you know, right on the heels of the government starting to reopen things because they're prioritizing like profit and and companies over people's lives. We've lost over 30 million jobs, you know, and for people to be seeing all this, like I, I was reading all of these tweets, you know, and people are like, our nurses are in trash bags because we can't afford to have them in PPE, but somehow the government was able able to like materialize all, like a fucking military force against us in tanks and with all these bullets and these tear gas canisters and and really like I think people are are seeing um even people who were probably seeing before that things are fucked up like it is so clear now um how much the police are violent um and will crack heads just because they fucking like to um and they get off on it and how like where our money is really going like they mm. are leaving us to fucking die to starve to lose our homes and and yet when we call them out on openly murdering with impunity they just that's where their money goes they're they're mad about a fucking arby's or a or a target burning and not a hundred thousand people that died from coronavirus i mean it's just it couldn't be more stark right now 100 yeah. percent, and it really shows you that you know the the whole lies of the fact that oh we couldn't afford this or we couldn't you know we didn't have the money bullshit you fucking yeah. had the money you just <laughs> didn't prioritize it that's the yeah. difference you know yeah. they had the money to to pour into healthcare if they actually wanted to we have the we have the resources we have the ability to actually take care of each other you know we we live in a post scarcity society and we have the means to actually care for one another if we had the political willpower and the imagination to actually implement those types of tools and resources in a way that's generative, in a way that's rehabilitative, in a way that is centered on caring for people. But instead, what are we actually seeing is the consolidation of power, the uh, ongoing equipping of police and the militarization of police forces in order to crack down upon the dissent that they know is coming. Um, and, yeah. and so, you know, it, it's... It's no wonder that you give cops all these fun toys and then they use them and, and use them to escalate because they want to use them, right? It, it, it's it's the central logic, right? When you get something new uh, in the mail or when you go to the store and pick something up, what's your first impulse? <laughs> <laughs> to use it, right? Like, of yeah. course, they're 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 they've got itchy trigger f trigger fingers as it is. God knows, and 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 they want to pull out all of their big toys, and so I don't know. I mean, we could we could spin our wheels um, for hours on this subject, and and God knows, I'm sure we'll uh, exhaust many episodes on uh, the, this ongoing crisis between our two podcasts. Yeah. Um, but I did want to. Um, invite y'all on the show actually before all this shit popped off to talk a little bit about uh, Bitchy Shit Show. Um, and, and first things first, uh, on a very unrelated <laughs> note, uh, why... Okay, so I love... Don't get me wrong. I, I love the name Bitchy Shit Show. I think it's really great. It's a fantastic name. But y'all used to be called Vegan <laughs> Warrior Princesses Attack. And I must say, this is a god-tier name for a podcast. Why would you <laughs> ever change it? Oh, uh, well, first of all, thank you for <laughs> all the compliments. Um, yeah, I just think we were feeling really hemmed in by the previous name. Um, I'll let Nicole kind of go into this more since she's really the visionary that uh, pushed the rebrand, um, which I quickly got on board with. But but yeah, we, we do. We will always have a lot of love for VWPA for sure. 
um, it, it brought us a lot of really good things. Oh, yeah. yeah, and we we did keep the platform, so we do play with the idea of maybe um, having it continue on in some capacity. You know, maybe we could do an episode a month where we interview someone and it's more collaborative or something like that. But we definitely held on to that because we, we do love it dearly. But yeah, we were finding, um, we just kind of got hemmed into the vegan community. And we right. were having, as we became more and more radical left us uh and our platform became more radical we just had a hard time kind of breaking into a larger audience of people who would really love our message and and probably really love our content but were just put off by the name you know it's like they couldn't find us and then we had a bunch of listeners who would say I know I have friends who would like your show, but I'm just not able to get them to listen because they think it's just all vegan stuff. And the irony was that we never actually really talked about vegan things <laughs> very often. <laughs> yeah. So it always was sort of a, a misnomer. And um, I come from a, a like a training and education background. And one of the things I, I've worked a lot in conferences and um putting together training programs. And one of the things I always harp on with people is like, make sure to title your program properly so that you're setting up the right expectations for your content. And it just started to feel less connected to our name as our content became different. So part of it was kind of strategic, hoping this would open us up to a new audience. And then part of it was also, I think just a little kind of emotional, mental, like we, the rebrand really did energize us and, and freed us up in a way that we probably could have just had, but there was something for us that was really symbolic about this, this fresh new start with the new branding and, and just having a new platform that, yeah, it's really, really energized us. Hell yeah. So tell me what is, uh, for folks who might not be aware, what is Pitchy Shit Show all about? What's the, what's the, uh, what's the elevator pitch? What's the plug? So the elevator pitch, uh, and we do nothing succinctly, so give me a moment. <laughs> Wait, yeah. you're saying that your show, which regularly puts out two and a half hour episodes, is not succinct? Uh, that doesn't check out. Logic. Uh, I'm not sure that. We, we always joke that Twitter is like the worst platform for us in the world because we can never get something into one tweet. It's always like that that thread. Um Yes. So I think it's kind of hard to contain what we do, but I think if I, when I, when I try to explain it to people, what we really try to do, what the, what the spirit of the show is, is to essentially deprogram people with love and friendship. So to explain that, um, we have both, as Callie mentioned before, you know, we've, we both grew up in abusive homes and gaslighting was a big part of our lived experience there. And as we've grown and we've learned more about how the world works, we just see that we're being gaslit and conditioned and programmed all the time by, you know, capitalism, white supremacy, et cetera, the patriarchy. Um, so something we wanted to do was really have something we've realized along the way is what we're actually doing is providing a space where people can come and laugh and learn, but essentially be told that this thing that you feel is off is true and there's a reason for it. And so we do a lot of stuff that may on the outside look silly or unimportant. Like we talk about TV shows or movies and we and, you know, people say we're taking things too seriously, but what we're doing is we're explaining this is what you've been conditioned to see as normal your whole life. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, even on VWPA, we had an episode about surprises and why surprises suck and how that ties into consent culture, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, that's amazing. <laughs> but at the heart, at the heart of all of it, and and we get very political too. We've had a on the new platform. We've had a lot of political episodes just because we ended up launching in the midst of this wacky election cycle, and then the <laughs> pandemic hit, and now we're in the middle of riots. And so we actually had had a lot of a more kind of what I would call softer topics we wanted to tackle, where they're they're more philosophical and they're kind of on this like, hey, just follow us through this journey of thought, and at the end. 
will guide you to a place where you're like, shit, I never thought about it that way, but you're true. It's true. And now that I see it, I can't unsee it. That's what we're really good at. Um, but the foundation of all of that is always our friendship and our chemistry with each other and the fact that we're always growing and learning. And so our, our rhetoric is very loose. We're always mm-hmm. saying like, we're in the midst of learning, come learn with us. So we're not coming from a place of, we already have things figured out and we're just trying to convince everyone that we're right. It's more like we're trying to challenge the way you think. We're trying to open you up to a different viewpoint. We're trying to analyze these everyday behaviors that actually uphold these oppressive systems that we don't even think about. And also we're just trying to have fun and laugh together. She and I literally talk for fucking hours offline. We will record a two and a half hour episode and then talk for another two and a half hours. <laughs> so it's it's very sincere. Yeah. It's it's not like we're not really trying we're not really trying to like get notoriety or do anything in the sense of ourselves. It's it's we literally love talking about these things and we just felt that we couldn't find a lot of media that was doing that at the time. So we were like, why not just put this out into the world and see if other people resonate with it? And they do. You know, we have a smallish platform, which, again, I think we could probably grow uh, to something bigger and something that could maybe sustain us financially. But at the end of the day, the people that we have have followed us for years and we consider them our friends and our family and we've learned from them as much as they've learned from us and we have a really tight-knit community that's incredibly supportive and I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. I feel like that shows that we're doing something really important, that we don't have we don't have like super fans. We're, we don't have sycophants. We have people who have built a relationship with us that is mutually beneficial over the years and we've learned from each other yeah yeah and we really wanted to offer something different I mean we're two people who just like to to think a lot about stuff and to kind of process by talking through things and we really want to offer a different kind of media where we didn't you know, the leftist space is relatively new to us, like kind of joining this online community. And it's been interesting seeing, you know, kind of a lane that we can fit in because it seems to us that so much of the the infighting and debates, which, you know, happen in every community. So this is no shade or anything, but that it's all about. It's like, a little oh, shade. It's a, well, it's a little bit of shade. A little bit of shade. <laughs> well, maybe a little. <laughs> um but it seems to be a, a lot of arguments about like uh, like labels and um, what have you read, you know, and we're we're people that like we got radicalized through Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. You know, we're just like, why the fuck can't everyone have food? Like we're not we're not um, really interested in being caught up in some of the, the arguments and the debates that a lot of leftists are. And so that's, I think, something unique that we can we really want to offer and show people like, Hey, if you're new to this game too, and you feel like, you know, Oh my God, I haven't read the conquest of bread or I haven't read all these things. I don't know Kropotkin or whatever the ABCs of anarchy. Um, I really can't engage in this material yet. It's like, absolutely you can, as long as your like principles are, are here with us, you know, as long as you feel strongly about the ethics of these movements, like you don't need to be a fucking, history expert on all of these movements and um and that's i think something that we we've been thinking a lot about recently because we've been starting to kind of feel that pressure ourselves and then had to kind of take a step back and be like wait a minute like that's not really what we're interested in it's not really what we offer so you know kelly i think you're wrong though i think uh, in fact people actually need to uh come to my very specific uh tendency they need to read my books uh <laughs> They need to buy my newspaper. They need to understand everything that I believe because I have, in fact, found the immortal truth, uh, the rich science of socialism, and I will deliver it like Moses delivering the tabernacle. I will descend from Mount Sinai, and I will bring it to the... Uh, no, I mean, um, I, you know, anybody who's listened to Coffee with Comrades uh, over our almost two-year duration now knows that you y'all are saying exactly the same shit that we've been saying on this program for for ages now and i think that um 
you know, it's encouraging to see folks that are part of uh, what I like to call the new sincerity. Um, like, you know, there, there, there was definitely this, like, phase where uh, <laughs> irony bros was, like, the thing, you know, uh, very... And it's funny that I'm bringing this up because I was literally just being an ir- irony bro two seconds ago with that <laughs> bad joke. Uh, but, you know, like, people will, you know, have this very jaded, cynical thing that I think comes from, like, you know the 90s and Seinfeld and this sort of, um, you know, petty bourgeois mentality. When in reality, like, I think people are really craving uh, just somebody, you know, being authentic and being transparent and being sincere. And I think that, um, you know, I think that uh, people are, are really, like, desperate for that because we live in such an atomized and, and alienating um, place. And so, you know kind of thinking about what y'all have been saying, um, you know, what is it that, uh, you think it is about, what is it, do you think it is about, um, these very insular, uh, kind of, um, social clubs that is informed by, like, patriarchy and machismo and this sort of, like, um, hyper-masculine know-it-all mentality, um, and, and how can we combat that to avoid the sort of gatekeeping that is so fucking pervasive uh, on the left? Well, I think you called it out. I think one of the biggest problems is that even counterculture um, groups or, you know, these movements that get started to kind of rebel against the mainstream, um, they don't really analyze patriarchy they don't really analyze this culture that we live in that prioritizes like cold hard logic and facts and stripping emotion out of it and and all of this stuff i mean one of the things nicole and i are kind of our first brush with this was we're both anarchists or anarchists of course we are we're both atheists and um i remember early on in the beginning of our show we started to we were following some atheist um podcasts and i kind of got involved with a a group online and I was just like what the fuck I was like this group is functioning exactly like a religion religion it's but with like a different daddy at the top and I was like what is happening like I genuinely did not understand and then obviously the more time I've spent now I'm like okay so this is kind of everywhere right like this is the problem (laughs) with um a lot of these counterculture movements is they're they reject the bad daddy that they don't like but they find a different one um Mm -hmm. because people are not really doing work uh the emotional work that needs to come with like really analyzing this whole like might makes right mentality and I can just argue you into the ground with facts and and I think that's why leftist spaces are like no I'm a tanky and I'm in this and I'm in this and like this is right and it's it's because we're not really looking at um problems holistically you know what I mean I couldn't agree more yeah and I see that there's a lot of quote-unquote activism out there or these I don't know if you call them educational spaces or whatever, but this content being created on these leftist ideas where the person giving you the content has essentially centered their identity around being right. (laughs) And I think that this is something we could probably talk about for hours. And so I won't get too into it, but um, I do think that, you know, this, this all comes out of like capitalism and patriarchy because People often feel like they have to market themselves on something. There's this debate culture and there's this sense that, um, you know, capitalism has greatly influenced this SJW cancel culture where now you have to adopt all these identities to have, you know, Angie Speaks did a great video on like social justice as a clout game and tying in this way that we essentially now try to see how much social power and capital we have based on like what marginalized identities we have. And then we Mm -hmm. weaponize those Mm -hmm. um, against other people to shut them down and keep them from being able to contribute to the conversation. So I think what I see, and I don't really follow many people who create this kind of content. I don't, I think 
to answer your question, one of the biggest things we can do to combat this is to not participate in it. Mm -hmm. So shut those voices out. Just don't, I'm not saying they should be shut down. I'm saying just don't follow them. Don't engage with it. Don't engage with people who are trying to put you in this logic box and choose you, uh, force you to perform in these, in these capitalist and patriarchal sort of, you know, catch 22 arguments or bad faith arguments. Um, But yeah, I think also as content creators, a big part of combating this is you have to decenter yourself in a way from the work that you're doing, which might sound weird because Callie and I have realized that we can talk about almost anything and the people who love our content will listen to it because they love us and they love our friendship. So in that way, we're sort of centered to the work that we're doing. But what I mean by that is that we have a flexibility to always change. We're always growing. We're always very open to other people's viewpoints. Um, we, we haven't centered our value in us being right about things. You know, we've centered our value in us being a safe space for people to come and learn and grow together and also just... Like you were saying before, Pearson, a lot of people are really lonely and literally just she and I having a really good friendship and like inviting people to participate in that friendship with us has been really foundational and uh, really important for a lot of people. And so that's that's what I see is that a lot of people doing this work where they're trying to logic bomb people and enforce this this one very homogenous set of ideas it's because they they have bought into the idea that they have no value to add if they aren't the right person and and they aren't basically colonizing this space with their idea and it always has to be their idea too right like they need to get credit for their idea Mm -hmm. if any they want other people to say that they're right, but they actually don't want other people to adopt what they're saying because then they lose the power of being the person who owns that idea. And that is just inherently anti-leftist. Mm-hmm. So I think in that sense, decentering your ego from the work that you're doing and seeing it as an open collaborative process, our podcasts might be one way in the sense that we're talking, it's recorded, people can't you know, directly talk back to us. But we can create the vibe and the spaces where it is actually a community project. Yeah. 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 Plus, I think people really haven't done the work. Like, they may talk about scarcity, but they don't see that they've internalized the idea of scarcity. You know? Like, we have so internalized these ideas of, like, patriarchy and capitalism and all of this stuff that they will act in their like leftists are talking about like communism and anarchy and all of these things and then still have this mentality of like you were saying Nicole like I have to be the best I have to be the most right I need to have the best content or else like I won't have a place in this movement it's like bro there's space like we got (laughs) like the internet is fucking endless like we got plenty of space (laughs) for everyone to have content like it's fine you know so we we need and that's why the work has to you know not to be all weirdly touchy-feely or anything but like we have to do the work not just like mentally but emotionally we have to really internalize being anti-capitalist and that's why our show even though sometimes it'll feel like a weird hodgepodge of stuff it's because like we are talking about all kinds of things but with these perspectives from media to the news to politics to to whatever like you have to have an anti-capitalist perspective a queer perspective in like everything because otherwise like you'll just end up repeating the same structures that you're trying to fight against you know I don't want I don't like hierarchies as an anarchist like why the fuck would my social justice movement have hierarchies that doesn't make any sense (laughs) yeah no totally and yet you know we still tend to create them I think even in anarchist spaces we can still create uh, you know, social hierarchies where we have social capital. I mean, that's one of the uh, one of the big lessons of Ursula K. Le Guin's magnum opus, The Dispossessed, right? Where, you know, why is it that hierarchy is occurring in an anarchist society? Well, it's because people have accumulated social capital and are now able to wield it in a way that uh, is a tool that bludgeons other people and, and, and silences them and, um, you know, creates a... a 
um, a homogenous type of um, worldview rather than a heterogeneous one. And I think that y'all are, are touching on a lot of interesting stuff here. I think, you know, there are two main things that are kind of leaping to the front of my brain. The first one is that, you know, I think the, one of the reasons why, and I've said this before, and I'm certainly not the first person to say it, um, but so and I do so I I say that not because I think it's my original idea, but because I don't want to be a dead <laughs> horse. But because, you know, the first real hierarchy that emerged was patriarchy, and you know if we're going to uh, disentangle disentangle ourselves, if we're going to extricate ourselves, then that has to be something that we consistently and unequivocally confront time and time and time and time and time again because it's going to keep cropping up. Uh, and the second thing is that... Um, have y'all read uh, Situated Knowledges by Donna Haraway? No. Uh, highly, highly recommend. Um, the essay is... I, I can send it to y'all if you want. Um, it's called uh, Situated Knowledges by Donna Haraway. Um, I think the subtitle is um, The Science Question in Feminism um, or something like that. Um, but basically, she makes the argument in the her, her central thesis, right, is that um, science and logic uh, are masculine tools that are used to, to silence uh, and um, create um, borders around what is accept what is seen as acceptable thought. Um, and uh, one of the uh, one of the lines that she has in there, which is fucking brilliant, is uh, science is the eye that fucks the world, um, and sort of this like idea that like. You know, scientific rationality and scientific logic is this new venerated, uh, almost it has almost a religious status, right? And that, you know, a, a, an actual feminist understanding of science would be one that confronts the di the ways that different types of knowledge emerge from different types of places, whether they those are um, indigenous sorts of knowledges, or whether they are knowledges uh, from other uh, marginalized communities, or whether they are um, something that comes organically out of uh, the scientific method of, of experimentation, or whether they are uh, socially informed, that we have all these different types of knowledges floating around, and creating these artificial hierarchies between them serves no one, and in fact it only uh, creates wedges and barriers between us. And I think that seeing these different types of knowledges as equitable is one big step towards potentially tearing down um, not just the hierarchies that exist in the left, but perhaps confronting the specter of patriarchy altogether. Wow. Yeah, we just had a really amazing conversation in our book club about white culture and how um, one one of the participants link, linked to a clip of a show where, you know, a black guy and a white guy were talking about stuff and the white guy's being problematic. And the black guy ends up saying to him, like, the thing is, is that you have also had your culture stripped from you, but you don't know it because you have these privileges that keep you from seeing that you have also had something stolen from you. And the reason I bring that up is because I think it's the, and, and, and then I brought up, like, it makes me think about appropriation. And there are a lot of reasons for that white people appropriate other cultures. But I do think at the emotional core of it, it's because we don't have, white culture is nothing. White culture isn't joyful. It doesn't have tradition. It's it's nothing. It's literally the culture of a colonizer. Totally. Right. Well, I mean, Italian that's... culture, French culture, those are those are actual cultures, but we've we've just had these things taken from us. And and the reason I bring it up is because I feel the same for patriarchy. I think patriarchy has taken from men and then by extension, it affects all genders. Um, it, it leaves you fragile and it leaves you with nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. Like when we think about become like applying a feminist lens to something it's usually based on connection and and care and deep understanding and learning and those those are things that you can fall back on those are things that nourish you and give you purpose and actually make you stronger because then you're not just you're not just basing your whole identity on being right or being strong or things that can be taken away from you um, and I think that those two are very active in the activists we see a lot of activists have trauma 
and they haven't dealt with it. And so they fall prey to a lot of these, these really oppressive structures to feel some sense of control and power. And so the work is to let that go and then to find the strength in the dismantling of those things. 100%. And I think that you're, you're right on the money with that, Nicole. I think that the idea, right, is that whiteness is the great homogenizer. It, you know, it, mm. it's, it's, it's like milk <laughs> to, to use, you know, <laughs> an analogy, like <laughs> you know, it's just like it cover, it's thick, it's viscous, it covers over everything. It's, it's fatty gross. and gross. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, I, I, I don't need to explain how disgusting milk is to, uh, <laughs> to two vegans, but, uh, the point is right. That, you know, whiteness has this capacity for erasure and i think that that's really it's it's fundamental function is erasure erasure both of black and brown and other marginalized communities but also like erasure of of other types of cultural identities and cultural signifiers i mean we see exactly this in noel ignitiev's right uh, work um how the Irish became white, right? It, you know, whiteness mm. has been used as a tool historically in order to continually divide and segregate greater and greater populations. Um, and it, it is a, um, uh, it is a, it is a, a label that is permeable that people can either move through or move out of. Um, and I think that, you know, whiteness as a as a social and racial construct has to be abolished if we are to have the type of liberation that we are looking for and, and it's interesting because we you know we've been kind of circling around patriarchy around um about, around race but i also think the the other crucial element here is naturally class right and and i mm. think that you know, with everything that has been going on over the last um, couple of days and will doubtlessly continue with the uh, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and Tony McDade protests, is that the kids in the streets, they're fucking smart as hell. And and if I was, I, 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 I kid you not, if I was as... Uh, on the ball about like class and gender and race as they are I, I at their age i don't know where i would be today i mean i, I don't know i i feel like i've i've lost precious years of my life while looking at these kids and it's so fucking inspiring to hear them like stand up and and speak their truth and talk about the the interconnected ways you know uh, it, here in the last three weeks, we're recording this on Sunday, May 31st, um, right after all of the protests are really starting to pick up. Um, you know, just in the past three weeks, Tallahassee Police Department has killed three different black people. Most recently was Tony McDade, uh, who they s consistently uh, misgendered. Um, Tony is a, is a trans man. Um, and, and, you know, hearing kids talk about and I, I mean kids like these are teenagers right talk about this and be incredibly aware of the intersections of class race and gender all together is so fucking inspiring and so if you're wondering why the three of us feel joyful about what's happening it's because people are recognizing their shared dispossession and their shared immiseration and are beginning to fight back Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I think about that all the time. Um, I just, you know, I came to activism so late, <laughs> you know, it feels to me, especially when I look to seeing like the kids now, these teenagers that are just like, well, fuck your like gender rules and shit in high school, in high school. Like I, oh my God, like. I just am embarrassed about the person that I was, you know, in my teen years and early 20s compared to what these kids and they just are are so radical and they're just so much more comfortable in like throwing off kind of this these oppressive structures that the adult world tries to force on us. Um, so, yeah, I, I am incredibly inspired by um because that's exactly what we need and they really do seem to feel a lot more like solidarity 
you know, in breaking barriers of like, oh, it, this doesn't have to be like my thing. Like this can be like a, a unique part of my identity, but I can also see how it relates to a way that like you're suffering, but in a different way. And like, that's really? cool, you know? Yeah, the yeah. activist movements could learn a lot, honestly, from <laughs> these teens and just how like fucking chill they are about all this stuff <laughs> with each other and then Dude, fucking for angry fucking at the state. Real. Oh my god, for <laughs> fucking real. I'm so and, and 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 this is kind of what we've been talking about this whole time. I'm so fucking tired of all of these like, you know, quote unquote like for lack of a better term professional leftists who have like thousands of twitter followers who are tweeting about all of the, the again the rich science of their chosen uh, political tendency when the kids are in the streets doing the fucking work and putting in in you know their their bodies on the line and it's like motherfucker stop reading what i mean don't, okay don't stop reading what people 200 <laughs> years ago wrote like that shit's good like you, you know we have uh, we have a phrase uh, on this program fuck theory do shit and people so often misunderstand what we're saying there. It's not, you know, disregard theory and do shit. It's not just read theory and do it, it, there's 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 a reason why it's equivalently balanced between fuck and shit is because both both of those things need to happen simultaneously. There's a dialectic there. But I think that mm -hmm. so many leftists could learn so much from just shutting the fuck up for a second and listening to the young black and brown kids who are in the streets right now who understand what the fuck is going on because it has been incredible to hear them just unleash uh, and, and, and to watch it and to witness it and to participate in it in some way, shape, or form has been absolutely invigorating. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we definitely need to leave behind a lot of this uh this gatekeeping i think yeah yes yeah and that's what i mean too with the uh the not really giving much attention or any of my energy or time to people who are doing this this debate style of quote-unquote activism because once you actually truly start working with people that shit goes out the window fast and one of the best things about or one of the things that makes someone a good leader is the flexibility to hear other opinions and shift and really if you're a leader your job should be more of a facilitator it shouldn't be that you're giving directions to people or you're determining what's going to happen and you're making the decision it's more around like just helping to facilitate the flow of the action that's happening and um i can just tell people so it's like okay you just won that debate online now what mm -hmm. what is the actionable what's the real life application that's going to come out of that Whereas you have people like Callie and I, and I think one of the one of the potential appeals of our show is that we're not very experienced in organizing or doing actions. Um, we're not set in any particular theory, or we haven't necessarily read all there is to read about you know everything. Um, but we both have an inherent radical nature. And so that can invite people in who feel like, I mean, she and I both like ha have had corporate jobs and are what a lot of people consider to be normie, which is funny because the normies think we're like terrifying. Um, <laughs> but I think living in that middle space is actually very inviting to people. And when I say we're trying to like deprogram people, that's what I mean. We're trying to get people where this is no longer scary. It's exhilarating. And you can't do that if you're just buried in theory and just trying to prove your point is right and mm. talk other people down from the questions that they have or the things that don't feel quite right. And, you know, now that we've been we've always educated along the way and I'm putting more effort into that with the book club. But it was funny because when the book club formed, we were like, oh, let's read Conquest of Bread. And then we were like, you know what, I kind of want to read like some indigenous literature and I kind of want to read some black perspectives and I kind of want to read some like feminist works and we'll get to it. But like, I just think centering this like Euro modern male perspective, not to say it's not important or foundational, but I just don't think people understand like how much is out there yeah. and how many different perspectives there are and that 
your your theory should never really be set. It should be evolving all the time. 100%. And something I've been thinking about lately is that if like you aren't like regularly shattered to your core, you're not doing the right work. Because I'm Callie and I both are consistently like fuck you know i'll read something or we'll hear something and it just like shakes us to our core and we have to like not that we were doing things wrong but it just shifts your perspective and you suddenly have this whole new world of thought open up to you and i can just tell that there's so many people where it's like they read one thing 10 years ago that reinforced the worldview that they wanted to have and then all of the work that they do is to is like confirmation bias of just reconfirming that same worldview and yeah i think if you're out here and you're doing truly like anti-racist like anti-patriarchal work you're just gonna constantly be like wow i just like consumed a piece of information that rocked my world and now i really need to think about it and now i'm like obsessed with talking about it to everybody to see what they think and like work this into to how i perceive the world yeah, it's funny. Something about we're always joking about it, and now I've come to appreciate it. But for a while, it it always kind of made me nervous. Like maybe we are doing something wrong. But it feels like we have just been like speeding along this freeway from the day that we started our first podcast. Like the leaps and bounds that we made. Like I think back on some of our earliest topics, and I'm like, my God, like what. <laughs> You know, compared to like the kinds of things that we say and we believe now. Um, and I thought that was maybe something to be like embarrassed of. But I actually think to be activists, like we should always feel on the move, right? Like totally. we should feel like we're never really like settled anywhere. Like it just feels like our feet have not stopped, you know, like figuratively, obviously. But, you know, in our in our learning on this path and and that's exactly how it should be. For everyone. I mean, all of these theories are important, but like I see from the little that I've started to see and engage with um, of like online leftist spaces, people are really arguing about like exactly the way the revolution is going to happen based on these books that were written hundreds of years ago by like Europeans. Like what? Like, do you... I know that they have to see how radically different our world is today. Like you really think the, re like people will argue about this is exactly the way the revolution is going to go <laughs> down because this is what, you know, fucking Marx said. And it's like, um, <laughs> what? Like those, those thinkers are, had incredibly important theories and we should be familiar with them. But like we have technology and and um we've internalized things that those thinkers couldn't possibly have imagined like totally. in their wildest dreams a world that they could not have foreseen it's not gonna there's gonna be no textbook there's gonna be no direct path of exactly what change is gonna look like just like none of us could have predicted that george floyd i mean how many people have been killed at the hands of police and and this sparking like 50 protests like nationwide, worldwide, within the span of four days during a global pandemic, like who could have seen that coming? You know, yeah. we just, we cannot predict. Um, and again, that's part of like everyone wanting this like daddy figure, everyone wanting this like fucking roadmap because they're too afraid to live in the uncertainty. And like, that's where we have to be. We have to be comfortable with the uncertainty because it makes us more fluid. It, it'll make sure that when challenges come up, we can actually deal with them. We don't have to be like, oh my God, this couldn't, this, was, uh, this wasn't a part of my plan. <laughs> like none of this is going to be according to plan none of it yeah i couldn't agree more and i think that you know there's something to be said for the um <laughs> sort of like uh weirdly like psychosocial way that everybody's looking for their daddy in like w like the next revolutionary <laughs> um you know i think there's definitely we're obsessed with daddy issues if yeah. you haven't <laughs> found out yet yeah no i well i mean uh, i i i'm not um super interested in psychoanalysis but one of the things that does really interest me um is uh Deleuze and Guattari's um anti-oedipus or capitalism and schizophrenia 
Um, and they talk about this uh, phenomenon uh, at, like ad nauseum. Um, it's it's very dense. Uh, I I would I highly recommend it to everyone, but it's also like hard as fuck to read. So you know, take that with a grain of salt. There are many other things that are better to read. Um, <laughs> but like the idea, right, that different political expressions still have this thing where they create their god, right? Mm-hmm. Um, whether it is Marx or, or Mussolini or, or Hitler or Donald Trump, they create their god and then they venerate that person. And I think that, and this is going to be contra- controversial, um, <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because, because we do try as much as possible to be anti-sectarian on this podcast... But I do think that that's one of the really rich things that anarchism has, is that there is no singular leader. There is no one direct person. I think that there really is something to be said for the decentralized way that uh, information and ideas and theory and action and praxis organically crop up in anarchic spaces. And I think that we're seeing exactly that happen with these decentralized protests that are erupting all across the United States. It's not one centralized leader. It is a lot of people um, who are pissed off, who are done uh, meekly being cowed by state violence and who are rising up in, in protest and uh, it, it is incredibly inspiring. And I think that, you know, it's one of the reasons why Donald Trump is trying to label capital A, capital N, T I F A, uh, a a terrorist organization because they don't know what to do. And, and you know, it, it is it's funny because anti fascism is a necessarily decentralized <laughs> philosophy. It's an idea. Um <laughs> it is a form of praxis. And so thinking of uh Antifa as the scapegoat, the bad guy, the terrorist organization is what these organ is what the state has to do in order to repress leftists so they can paint us with a wider brush because they are beginning to realize that we don't have any fucking leaders and moreover we don't need any fucking leaders. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't um this is obviously pretty groundbreaking for all of us right now, but um seeing all the news coming out, I was just kind of stunned how quickly people started to be like white anarchists antifa like you are the ones being violent it's these outside agitators and i was like wow that happened fast like even people you know that are like comrades like people that are they get it they're you know woke tm and that they're still like oh my god it's like these fucking white anarchists and all these groups that are the ones being violent and it's like okay um so you see how fucking bad the government is and you're going to take their word all of a sudden of like why these protests are going violent. It's it's crazy to me, you know, but it's so common because we like we we are not used to not having like a daddy and a bad guy to fight. You know, like we need things being broken into groups. And um, yeah, th- there's going to be. There's going to be a lot of that. The government is going to be scrambling to try to come up with, like, the group that we need to wage war against. You know, it's it's always a war against something that's defined, even when it's undefinable, like the war on drugs, the war on poverty, you know. The war on terror. The war on terror. Mm -hmm. Like, my God, you know. I mean, again, like the KKK isn't designated as a terrorist group. And yet the president today tweeted that he is going to designate anti-fascists as terrorists. It's like they're they're not a group. And and already the conspiracy theories of like, oh, they're out there being funded by like George Soros or whoever the fuck they always claim some billionaire. That's like, why would they give their money to well, it's also, I mean, it's a, it's an anti-Semitic <laughs> it's, it's dog outrageous. whistle. Like, the, the, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. they, they know that George Soros is Jewish, and so it's it's intentionally an anti-Semitic dog whistle to signal to the far right about the sort of, um, you know, globalism, right? And and I, I'm, I'm using yeah. that term, like, because it's the, the term that the far right use, not like 
global capitalism, but but just globalism abbreviated because there are these conspiracy theories about, um, you know, a, a small cabal of, of Jewish uh, financiers who are funding the revolution. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, it smacks of anti-Semitism and, and it's, you know, not surprising because it's coming from these white supremacist right. douchebags. But what is, I think, um, really telling is that, you know, this shit's like not gonna stop (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. it's it's just getting started and um i would not be surprised and i could be totally wrong but i would not be surprised if we start to see something uh like sort of every weekend people are taking to the streets all across the united states in mass sort of like what we saw last summer with le gilet jaune in in france like that would not surprise me in the least um i could be proven wrong only time will tell um, but right now, in these early days, it definitely, at the very least, feels like something is shifting. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in a capital R revolution because I think that's again really patriarchal and silly. Um, but I do think that this could be potentially, maybe, maybe the dream of abolition could be realized, and we could get these fucking police out of our communities. That would be uh. amazing. Yeah. Well, and honestly, something's got to happen, you know, Um, because we are headed. The thing that a lot of, you know, the liberals and the the normies and stuff that like to engage in, like they're just their heads are in the sand about the economic crisis that we're headed into. And like we are not prepared like this whole like the police so quickly being able to like. Uh, militarize against protesters like this is a this is a trial run like this is to see what's going to happen because like you think people aren't going to be in the streets when like there's no food you know when When there's 40 percent unemployment yeah right Mm -hmm. like it's going to be really bad and so I hope that the continued pressure keeps up I mean we saw in France and um, in Hong Kong, right? Like what can happen when a lot of people can just like regularly like turn the fuck up in the streets? I think that is that what they call the pulse surge, right? It's when like a lot of people just kind of regularly can like come together and materialize like that has a lot of and that's what we're seeing right now. Like the fact that this got so big so quickly, they cannot fucking handle it. I think I read this morning it was up to like eight or nine states were um, talking about calling in the National Guard against these protesters like we have them fucking scared. Oh, for sure. In Atlanta, the police were, were saying over the dispatch radio, we're outnumbered four to one. And you're goddamn right, That's you are, right, motherfuckers. <laughs> yep. You're That's goddamn right. right. You are and that's what the people right. need to hear. We do outnumber yeah. them. They only have power if we think that they have power. The system only, it's like, it's weird to be living in a world that basically is running on like fairy tale imagination. Oh my like, God. The, uh, I they feel only have power because we think by they... it. Like, it's yes. all imaginary. Yes. Capital is imaginary, power is imaginary. <laughs> it's all just not, none of it is real. Well, not, right. it's not, that's not true. Some of it is real. Like, like you know. The power that is manifested by a gun is real, right? Yeah. But at the same time, like, uh, what is more powerful? The power, the power of uh, five hundred people and one like firearm, or uh, the mm. firearm? I, you know, yeah. Those are the sorts of calculations that probably escape the purview of this conversation. But the point stands that there is a fundamental difference between. Uh, actual power and the way that it manifests in the social and collaborative and cooperative free and voluntary association between human beings and other non-human animals and power as we imagine it to actually be um yeah yeah so i think that you're you're absolutely right about that yeah well and i think too that people also think that the power is permanent and absolute So, yeah, you might have cops with guns, but that's only also as long as they choose to have those guns and use them against us. And we have to go into this expecting that. But there's also, um, you know, we're seeing, for instance, like union workers are starting to join in, right, and starting to say, no, I'm not going to support the police in this. I'm not going to help do anything against these protesters that's very powerful and it's not 
beyond possibility that we'll start to see the National Guard or cops being like, this is fucking nuts. Like, I'm not doing this. You know, if you have, for instance, enough nurses who are standing up saying no, and then you have cops given orders to go, like, kill nurses, there just might be a point. Like, we can't always just assume that that power has to be, like, every last cop has to be killed, right? Or every last cop has to be taken out. Like, there is a, a momentum that can take over once the power balance shifts then mm -hmm. you you can see that shift happen and it's it's kind of like a snowball effect totally. if you will yeah totally that's but how yeah, revolutions we just, happen we just think like oh the military's there and the military's always going to be there and it's like it might like we we do have to prepare for that but at the same time these are still people even though they don't act like it most of the time um but yeah this this whole thing is fluid and this whole thing is mostly fueled on you know emotion and and what the end goal is and i guess it's kind of like what we were saying about white culture and patriarchy i mean the cops in the military are like that too they have been gutted mm -hmm. they don't have a purpose they don't have something that like truly fuels them and gives them joy and gets them up in the morning you know they enjoy the violent work that they do but it's not a, a life purpose the way like us fighting for freedom and fighting for equality and fighting for people to have resources that like fucking will will fuel you and that's why i think there just hits a point where probably a lot of them are going to be like Ugh. like you know i don't want to do this this totally. isn't giving me anything um, so I think we always have to keep that in mind that like, it's not, it's not just the raw numbers of like, what do they have versus what do we have? It's also like, what are we doing here and how many people are, are getting caught up in it and joining it and changing, shifting what the emotional landscape is. Yeah. And our biggest power right now, no matter what role you take in this, um, is like seeing opening people's eyes to reality. I mean, pe like, I can't believe like all the journalists that were like, they're fucking shooting at me right now. You know, like yeah. videos and of it's journalists, like, yeah, wake and up. the cops like literally on video aiming right at them. You know, um, the fact that a black journalist was arrested before the cop that murdered George Floyd, you know, things like this are shaking the foundations of people's belief in patriotism in the America that they were told as children existed like it does not exist. It, it never did, but it certainly as hell <laughs> exists less now than it has. Um, and that's where we can really reach people is people seeing like people at home seeing like, why are they doing that to those protesters? Like they were standing there and then they gassed them in the face, you know, and then other cops may be starting to see, I watched some video, like not to give any fucking sympathy towards cops, but I watched this Twitter video last night of, um, this black woman who was like pleading, like she was pleading in tears with this white cop. She was like, it's okay. Like you can kneel with us. Like I can see, I can see you're sad. And his face was beat red and he was like crying, you know, kind of silently. And you could tell he wanted to, like, she was just like, you can kneel with us, baby. Like it's fine. And he, another cop came over and tapped him on the shoulder and dismissed him and put a different cop in his place who was holding a baton. Fuck. Disgusting. And it's like, right? So yeah. disgusting. And, but like, some of these people can be reached. Like, some of them still have some humanity and can, and can see that what's happening is not okay. And once you show them that they're not on the right side, um, I, maybe naively have some faith that like, there are a lot more people out there that once they realize how fucking cruel things are and that it's unnecessary scarcity is unnecessary there's no reason why no one um why people can't have food why not everyone can have a house like all of these things um no, totally. I, I i think there will be a tipping point of momentum you know i couldn't agree more and i think that you know Howard Zinn wrote about this in uh, A People's History of the United States. He has this entire chapter devoted to it called The Changing of the Guard. When the police and the military during a revolution lay down their arms and join the sides of the protesters. Or, better, use their arms in order to defend the protesters. Yes. Um, so I think that, you know, it's possible that we might see something like that. I mean, lots of revolutions have played out in that way. And, and you know, when people say all cops are bastards or fuck the police or 1312 or fuck 12... 
They are saying that your specific racist uncle, who also is a cop, is a bastard. They are saying that as, like, that individual is a bastard. But they're also saying that it is the systemic power structure that is crushing and dehumanizing black and brown and marginalized and queer folks all across the United States and indeed all across planet Earth. That is absolutely heinous and, and it is critical that we abolish it immediately um, as quickly as possible. And and I think that, um, you know, there is something to be said for um, people coming over to the side of liberation. And, and I think that uh, we always need to be on the lookout for that sort of thing. Um, I think, unfortunately, I've seen too many uh, leftists and... and Oftentimes, uh, too many fucking anarchists say that, like, oh, you can't be a part of the left if you're a veteran. Fuck that. Fuck that. Get the fuck oh, out what? of here. Yeah. I know. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. I don't like that at all. No, it's no. bad. It's it's definitely a bad take. Not a good take at all. Um, Not a good take. But I've I mean, seen... some of the people that have done the best work are mm -hmm. ones who were on the inside and totally. were like, what the fuck is happening, you know? 100%. 100%. I mean, we need whistleblowers. We need people from all walks of life, yeah. all faiths, all creeds, all cultures. Um, I want a beautiful, heterogeneous, celebratory, uh, multicultural movement of liberation for all. And, and it's not going to happen if we start gatekeeping and saying, you can't come in because you don't have my particular tendency or because you had a different type of... Uh, background or because you were forced into the military because you had no other fucking options and then realized that it was bad and came over to our side like fuck all of that we gotta we gotta you know stick together um we we have to create a uh organic and a spontaneous and a inviting and welcoming movement uh we have to stop being such insular asshats and start being more <laughs> fucking welcoming to people and and that's kind of where i want to kind of close with y'all um today is just to kind of think a little bit about you know what it might mean to make the left more welcoming and more inviting to people because i think so often we've been kind of circling around this for a while now but i think so often the left can be really subcultural in not a good way um, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be a subculture. I want to be a counterculture. I want to tear down the, uh, the popular culture and the hegemony that it has and the hierarchies that it creates. And I want to make a world where, uh, these ideas are, are popular, um, and that they're not just these small little circles where we are all vying for different social capital or for clicks or retweets or likes or Patreon subscribers or what the fuck ever, but where we're actually like you know, building something meaningful. And I think that, you know, the way that capitalism has insinuated it in itself even into uh, popular movements for social liberation are oftentimes difficult to disentangle and have to, uh, you know, require really systemic and conscious uh, and active work in tearing them down and dismantling them. And so I'm curious what y'all think it might mean to create a authentically inviting and welcoming left. That was a long ass question and I rambled a lot. <laughs> no, no, it was a great question. Yeah, I think the first step is just as, as activists, as leftists, is to do a really long like deep gut check on ourselves and make sure we're doing these things for the right reasons I think a lot of times people start to they start to really like being as you said a, a subculture it's the thing that makes them feel special um, because capitalism makes none of us feel special so we're always trying to like kind of find our click right and people start to really like that they get to feel morally superior to other people that they get to kind of be part of this elite club. Um, and I think a lot of activists end up not really, they may think they want a world, the world that they envision, but they don't actually want it because that would make the thing that makes them special, not really be special or unique anymore. So the first thing we can, can do I think is really check in with ourselves and make sure that we are we honestly care about like letting go of that um 
one of our friends, um, Afco, uh, a, an amazing author, we had a conversation with her on our podcast and she was saying like, I don't want to be an activist forever. Like I'm, I'm doing this because I want to be fucking normal. Like I want, I don't want to feel like my life is in danger when I go out. Like I, I, I want this kind of world so that I can just like be with my fucking family and, and do what I want. And I think sometimes as she said, and, and we agree with her that activists lose sight of that. Like we see this like, Oh, my life is going to be special and I'm going to have this fight forever. It's like, I don't want to fucking fight forever. I will. Cause I don't necessarily think that we will see change in our lifetime. I would love it if we did, but um, yeah, we kind of need to drop, drop that ego you know, and, and really make space for people to come in from all, from all backgrounds. We can't predict, you know, who's, who's going to have a change. It doesn't necessarily need to be like the poor kids or, um, kids that like suffered trauma. I mean, I was like normie growing up. I was normie until I was like 25, you know, and look at me now as embarrassed as I am to admit that. So people can be reached. And I think we need to make space and not do this like weird testing of people's street cred, you know? Yeah, I love that. I think, too, um, we have to really dismantle our ideas of success or what our goals are. I think as content creators or volunteers, for instance, I'm uh, volunteering with Raven Core, which is a really cool youth group um, that's based out of Portland, Oregon. I highly recommend checking them out. Um, and, you know, I was talking to the organizer that I'm working with, and she was like, it's hard for us to get people to work with these kids because sometimes the calls only have like three or four kids on them, and they want like a certain number for it to be worth their time. And so, and I think you can expand that out into like how many Twitter followers you have or how many views you get, or are you going to watch someone's video if they only have 36 subscribers? You know, there's, there are a lot of ways in which we sort of determine who has a platform and who has a voice based on essentially other people's opinions and support of that person. So I think in whatever way we can kind of dismantling that and seeing that, you know, that's something like thought slime is one of our favorite YouTubers. And one of the things I love is that he dedicates a portion of every episode to new newbie left lefty projects, um, to like help them get views, but also to just to validate that. And I think non-compete also makes a point of bringing in people, no matter how small, if they have something valid to say, giving them a platform and not being like, oh, I'm only going to work with other people who are already established. Um, or I think or just, people who can make me like even bigger than I already am because they're bigger than exactly. I am. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Pearson, so I that's think... what you're doing with us. And like exactly. your show, Coffee with Comrades, like it's so fucking radical, you know? Yeah, yeah, like what you're doing here and kind of decentering yourself and a lot of the, the work that you're doing with the show is really important. So I just think in all these ways... That's really important. And I just also think that, you know, we have to challenge this view. We get, a, and it's annoying, but we get a lot of people who are like, I love you, even though sometimes I don't agree with you. Um, and I've been thinking about that a lot lately, especially thinking about these other people who do work where their followers are just kind of like mobs, you know, like if anyone challenges th their leader, then they just attack them. And I'm like, our followers would not do that. And our people who like love us, like really love us and they would defend us. But our listeners would not go attack someone else on social media. They just would never. I mean, half of them don't even like have social media. Like they're <laughs> just not interested. Um, and, I, and I've just been thinking about that a lot. And it's like, how do you cultivate that kind of community when you are someone putting out content? And I do think at the heart of it, it's like, you know, do I get something out of this relationship with you and that's why I follow you even when I disagree and pretty much everyone who listens to us disagrees with something because we're constantly pushing these ideas. We're not trying to make people think the way we think, but we're constantly challenging ourselves, and thereby challenging our audience with like new and more radical ideas um, versus I think a lot of people have platforms around I love you because I agree with you. Totally. 
I love you because you reinforce the worldview that I want someone to reinforce so I don't have to change. Mm -hmm. And so I think as a creator, think about that. And then as, you know, someone consuming content, think about that. Are you only ever consuming things that reinforce your world worldview? And are you attacking people or trying to silence or dismiss them? Because it's one thing we have a lot of constructive conversations with people who are like, I don't know, I'm not comfortable or I'm not quite there yet or or I have these concerns and that's all amazing. And and both parties tend to grow from that versus people who are like, you're a piece of shit and like, I'm going to try to crush you because I disagree with you. So I think, you know, the a space that could be open and beautiful and collaborative would be a space where... Nobody has too big of a platform where they can just crush out everyone else, but also just that we're all learning and growing from each other. And there's not this sense of like factions and people fighting against one another. And it's okay to find people who you like more align with. Like I tend to not listen to anything that's liberal because it pisses me off, frankly. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm constantly watching people where, where they're, they're leftists and they're doing radical work but i may not fully agree with them but it's it's good to have your viewpoint challenged totally. and um from someone you respect and so i just think generally you know decentering your identity from the beliefs that you have can be really important um it can be tricky because obviously you want to like have some kind of morals that make up your your identity but i think you know feeling that whatever I can use, I can use whatever words I want because I'm part of the dirty left and that's what we do. Right. Like we're, we're dismantling things by like making everything open market. Like, okay. If you have that belief, like consume some media that's from the other side without just trying to disprove and dismantle it and mm -hmm. be open to the fact that like that priv that you're like using a privilege to feel like you have an identity, but yeah. you could have a different identity based on something better. Yeah. Yeah. All that, uh, is incredibly well said. And I think a beautiful note to leave it on, uh, Callie and Nicole, this has been, uh, honestly, it's been a delight. Your show is such a pleasure and joy to listen to. Uh, it's just very cathartic. It, it's filled with righteous fury and, and yes. it just makes me angry in the best way. Uh, and I, you know, whenever I finish an episode, I can't help but breathe a little easier. So uh, I really appreciate y'all coming on the show, and I am excited to see how Bitchy Shit Show continues to grow. Before we say goodbye, could y'all let listeners know where they can go to listen to your podcast and support your work? Yes. So our podcast is available pretty much everywhere. Podcasts are available. Um, and if you don't use a, a podcasting app, then you can go to bitchyshitshow.com and listen directly on the website. And then um, it would actually be really, really helpful to us. We're trying to get our YouTube channel up to a thousand subscribers so that we can access some of the, the features on YouTube that they don't let you access until you have that many so we, uh, on YouTube, we live stream a town hall every week where we let people, we just kind of talk about how we're feeling, talk about whatever's going on, and then really engage and interact with the, the comment section so that we can have some real time interaction with our community. And we're going to start live streaming, uh, recording our episodes, <laughs> Oh hell yeah. which should be really fun. Yeah. So, so it's just another medium to kind of, um, consume our content in a different way and also have access to us in in more of a real-time situation so anyway twitter instagram and youtube you can find us bitchy shit show everywhere um we're the only ones with that name i always like to <laughs> shockingly <laughs> yeah. someone else hasn't taken it um but yeah if you want to support the show uh subscribing to youtube if youtube is a thing you enjoy it would actually be really really helpful for us right now sick yeah. Well, awesome. thank you so much for having us. This really was like such a fun conversation and we just really uh, respect and admire the work that you're doing to connect yes. like other leftists and showing a diversity of ideas and personalities and outlooks. It's incredibly important that we don't become silos. So thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Solidarity, y'all. And that about does it for this week's episode of Coffee with Comrades. This is an entirely DIY show run by workers for workers. If you like what you hear, you can follow us on Twitter at Coffee W Comrades and Instagram at Coffee with Comrades. 
Check out our website, www.coffeewithcomrades.com, and sign up to support our work with a monthly contribution by going to www.patreon.com forward slash coffeewithcomrades. You can find Coffee with Comrades on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you go to get your anti-capitalist propaganda. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. While you're there smashing that subscribe button, be sure to rate and review the show as well to help us increase our reach. If you have feedback, criticism, or you'd just like to get in touch with us, shoot us an email at coffeewithcomrades at gmail.com. Until next time, stay wild out there. Yeah.